May 1970. National student dissent over Richard Nixon's policy in Vietnam was coming to Portland, Oregon. President had gone back on his campaign promise to withdraw American troops from Vietnam. Instead, he decides to invade Cambodia and draft 150,000 more young people into the military. Universities across the country explode in protests. Demonstrations become even more intense when four students at Kent State University in Ohio are shot and killed by National Guard soldiers. More than 500 colleges find trouble at their doorsteps. Demonstrations, teach-ins, sit-ins, and student strikes disrupt campus routine. Students barricade the streets around Portland's park blocks and shut the university down. On May 11th, the tactical squad of the Portland Police Bureau forced the demonstrators out of the park blocks with a demonstration of their own. The tactics that the police use have never been seen before in the city of Portland, and the violence shocks the community. How could this happen here? It's going to be a long, hot summer in the city. 1970. A political thunderstorm is headed for Portland when Richard Nixon announces he will visit the city in August and host a convention of 25,000 members of the American Legion. Anti-war activists from up and down the West Coast are ready for a rematch. They also make plans to visit Portland and disrupt Nixon's convention. One of the main protest groups to emerge in Portland that summer was known as the People's Army Jamboree. With support from Vietnam Veterans Against the War, also known as the VVAW, the People's Army Jamboree turned its attention to the American Legion Convention, scheduled for late August in downtown Portland. This would be a good opportunity for the group to make a statement against the Legion's unconditional support of the Vietnam War. The specter of fear was rising in Portland. Business owners were boarding up their storefronts as if a hurricane were approaching. If the governor and his staff were going to find a solution to this problem, they were going to have to act fast. Meanwhile, a group called The Family was thinking of alternatives to a confrontation, like that of May 11th's Bloody Monday. Thousands of young people would be arriving in Portland, and they would all need a place to stay. Not all of them would be interested in politics. Many were coming simply to express the need for a new and better lifestyle. How about staging a rock concert? That would attract even more people. What the group needed was a piece of land where everyone could camp out, have fun, and show the American Legion that people can live together in a peaceful and cooperative setting. Throughout the festival, several famous rock bands were rumored to be on their way to Vortex. But no name acts ever played. It was all local musicians, some from California, some from Washington.
amazingly clean. A massive kitchen installation has begun. Everyone is fed. There is no charge. Zydell was a ship dismantling company in Portland at the time, and they had donated some big, huge pots for cooking massive amounts of food in. And they even provided the steam engine that they trucked out there to cook these huge cauldrons of food. We kept a helicopter up on the top of the hill because there had to be downtown also. The command center for the festival was set up in Suite 2020 of the Hilton Hotel in downtown Portland. And I, I recall being there almost two weeks, moving to Portland with some of the governor's staff. A small group of government officials had sequestered themselves at the Hilton, monitoring every detail of the Legion Convention, the People's Army Jamboree, the various parades and demonstrations, and Vortex. A contingent of National Guardsmen waited in the hotel's underground parking area, armed and ready to take charge of the streets if necessary. Tom McCall would be up for re-election just weeks later in November, facing a strong opponent who openly criticized Vortex. I think that he made a basic error of judgment. I think that the, that the damage that we're going to have to pay because the governor permitted the laws to be broken freely at MacGyver Park is a matter of very serious concern. The Vortex experiment was, at almost every level, a risky venture. To my knowledge, we didn't put any insurance in place. First of all, we didn't have time. Things were happening very quickly. Secondly, I don't think anybody would have insured it. McCall, he rolled the dice. When's the last time a candidate did that? Well, I'm ashamed to say that at the time, I was so involved in the music and what we were doing musically that I didn't know that there were all these political ramifications and its purpose. We just thought, a festival, all right. Vortex, this free-spirited festival of love and life, took place within a shell of government oversight. We had undercover law enforcement officials in the park, so we would prevent people from being hurt to the degree possible. We had a company of National Guard. They were camped up at the top of the steep road and back out of sight in case we needed more manpower. A state police SWAT team was stationed in a park maintenance building. I didn't have any idea. I don't think any of us knew that. It would be counterproductive to bring that to our attention, I think. <laughs> Vortex could not be without the support it has and is receiving from government. But that fact can't take anything away from the youngsters inside who are proving that you don't need the yellow pages and high salaries to get things done. Led by a loose-knit group called The Family, countless numbers of volunteers made Vortex work. But much of the food, the music stage, the sanitation and other amenities came from private businesses. The Portland business community financially supported Vortex because they knew it was in their interest to not have downtown trashed. No single person seemed to be running the show, but Ed Westerdahl, executive assistant to Governor Tom McCall, was, in fact, in charge of Vortex. Tom was the policymaker. He wasn't the day-to-day -day doer. And basically, his statement was, Ed, do whatever you think is right. Westerdahl oversaw the law enforcement and National Guard units at Vortex and in Portland. I was the only one who could authorize intervention, but there was very little that went wrong. Richard Nixon canceled his Portland appearance. The American Legion Convention proceeded without incident. And the vast number of war protesters never materialized. Only a few thousand showed up in Portland. As it turned out, the predictions from the FBI were way off. But attendance at Vortex far exceeded expectations, attracting somewhere between 30 and 100,000 people, some of whom otherwise may have joined the crowds in Portland. The expected crisis had been averted, and the governor turned his attentions to the upcoming election. 
he wins by a higher margin than he did in his first term. He's deemed as heroic, risk taker, brave. And then in the second term, all those initiatives that define Oregon from that era get passed and signed into law. Land use planning, the beach bill, the bottle bill. Vortex One was, and still is, the only state-sponsored rock festival in U.S. history. Federal intelligence indicated early this summer that upwards of 50,000 young people would be coming. Vortex was a conscious and direct response to the problem of suddenly trying to absorb those thousands of young people into the city of Portland, young people without a place to stay. And they had forged a relationship between the counterculture movement in Portland and the state's highest elected official in a collaborative way to solve the problem. There has never been a Vortex 2. There's more about Vortex 1 on Oregon Experience Online. To learn more or to order a DVD of the show, visit opb.org. Funding for Oregon Experience is provided by the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation, the Ann and Bill Swindell's Charitable Trust, the Oregon Cultural Trust, and from viewers like you. Thank you. <laughs>